Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Today we're going to talk about Canon's 5D Mark IV, a camera with a four and a half year gestation period. Uh, really an incredibly long period of time, especially given what the competitors like Panasonic and Sony are doing with what appear to be annual upgrades to their gear. Um, is it a snore? Uh, is it just poor? Or is it something uh, more significant? Uh, let's talk about that. Now, the fact of the matter is, I haven't had one in hand. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't even know that I'm going to reach out to my usual sources to try to get my hands on one. There are two bloggers in particular who have already gotten their hands on the 5D Mark IV. Uh, my bud, Planet Mitch at Planet 5D. So he's got some good videos on Mare and uh, Rolling Shutter. I'll reference them in the uh, links below. Uh, and the guy who I think is the smartest, the best digital imaging blogger out there, Tony Northrup has gone really in depth. So my intention is not simply to tell you what they said, but to take them at their word and then draw conclusions about what that means in terms of uh, strengths and weaknesses, who is it for, and really, most interestingly to me, uh, what does it portend for Canon at a broader level and the industry itself. So, sexy time. Let's cut to it straight away and say that the Mark IV uh, is a significant step up from the 5D Mark III in terms of specifications, but it cannot escape the limitations of the DSLR form factor, and by that mean, I mean an optical viewfinder, nor the limitations of Canon's prime directive, uh, the same one for all publicly traded companies, which is to maximize shareholder value. So let's talk about the signature change in the 5D Mark IV, 4K, DCI full 4K. But with that being said, there uh, has been a bump in a number of other specifications, and uh, let's go through them. So the first thing is uh, bigger sensor not in terms of uh, uh, measurements, but in terms of megapixel count. So it's risen from 22.3 megapixels to 30.4. The 5D Mark IV has a touch screen. Uh, it has improved autofocus lifted directly from the 1DX Mark II. It has GPS, it has Wi-Fi, it has near field communications connectivity. It has something called dual pixel RAW, as opposed to dual pixel autofocus, which it already has. Interesting HDR, high dynamic range in camera, potentially obviating the need for log, which it does not have, but that's available in 1080p only, and a slightly higher burst rate of seven frames per second. So if that's the headline on the changes in specification, what's actually happening in practice? Okay. So here's what we know, courtesy of Tony uh, and Mitch. So what I was able to see from Mitch's uh, comparison of the 5D Mark IV to the 5D Mark III to the 5D Mark II is that in video, it's noticeably sharper. Now, he had the same lens on all three cameras. It's possible that there was lens-to-lens -lens variation, which accounts for this, but I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, it's just sharper. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when Mitch looked at Moiré and Rolling Shutter, Moiré looked a little bit worse on the 5D Mark IV. Rolling Shutter looked a little bit better. I'll just sit there and say, not much of a difference. So, okay, we've got that. Uh, still, something like the Sony a7R II with 42 megapixels is going to be significantly sharper doing stills. And because the A7R2, the A7S2, don't have anti-aliasing filters while the 5D Mark IV continues to have an AA filter, I suspect that the Sony's will be sharper uh, in video as well. Now, uh, 
touchscreens. If you like touchscreens, you'll be happy because now the 5D Mark IV has one. It doesn't tilt, it doesn't swivel, and it's the same interface that the 5D Mark III had, the 5D Mark II had, and the fact of the matter is that'll be comforting to many people because you don't have to change the way you do things if you're already familiar with Canon, and by now you've gotten used to it. But if you are coming into Canon, it's not a particularly impressive implementation of touch screen UI. In fact, it doesn't hold a candle to the two reference standards in my book uh, from the perspective of software UIs in physical cameras that would be Hasselblad's new UI uh, that they put on the H60 and the X1D and from uh, a pure software uh, camera perspective uh, whether it's Android or Apple, I happen to be an Apple guy, uh, smartphone UI is so far beyond anything that any of the camera makers are doing. In fact, the only reason why the Hasselblad is as good as it is, it's because it's beginning to approach the intuitiveness and ease of use of a smartphone app. So that's that. Uh, as far as autofocus, uh, Tony says that it was already great and now it's even better. He says it's the best that he's ever seen and I'm sure that uh, that's right. It's the best that he's ever seen. Uh, the dual auto focus, the dual pixel auto focus though, when I've seen it, it hasn't rocked my world. I'm used to Sony A6000, A6300, A7R2, uh, Sony's eye focus, uh, Sony's facial recognition and my personal belief is that this is the best autofocus out there. So it would be interesting for me to compare the two directly. But there's a larger issue. Uh, when you talk about dual pixel autofocus, what many people don't realize is that in order to take advantage of it, you need STM technology in the lenses. Now, if you have STM lenses and you're comfortable with the quality, you're good. You're great. But uh, if you're not, and I had some issues with some of the STM lenses, then, then maybe less so. Certainly, uh, most of the L glass does not uh, offer STM technology. And in fact, uh, I reference a conversation I had with Chuck Westfall, Mr. Cannon, last fall in New York, where he addresses this very directly. The GPS tagging, it's a nice feature. It's, it's a nice to have. It's smartphone-like because then you can see where it is that the photos were taken, so that's good. Uh, Wi-Fi implementation, I haven't seen a good Wi-Fi implementation in any hybrid camera, in any video camera. I, I haven't seen it. It's cumbersome. It's uh, time-consuming. It's, it's icky. Now, Tony says that Nikon's SnapBridge actually works really well. Uh, I'm sure he's right, but uh, he says that the Wi-Fi implementation on the 5D Mark IV is kind of the same as everything else, in which case I wouldn't use it. I don't even use it on the Sonys. Um, yeah, okay, that's that. And near field communications, I don't use it. The idea of banging my phone against the camera just doesn't do it for me, so. Uh, if you like it, good, it's there. I really have nothing to say about it. This dual pixel RAW uh, appears to be something that overpromises but under delivers. The idea is that you can have slight pixel shifts which can change, uh, or you can change in post to change very slightly the focus point. Tony uses the example of a, a portrait where, let's say, it's the farther back uh, located eye that's sharp, whereas the closer to the camera eye is less sharp. And, and he couldn't really uh, see a significant difference using the dual pixel RAW. My view is that however you do it, it would be very hard to beat Sony's eye focus. Uh, 
I'd be interested in seeing that. The bottom line is that the 5D Mark IV is not a poor man's light field camera. It's not a Lytro camera. And uh, I mean, I guess on the one hand, kudos for giving it a try, but I don't know that anybody was really asking for that. Uh, HDR, uh, I really find that fascinating. I'm sorry that it's only in 4K. I don't know how well it works, but the idea of being able to get a wide dynamic range without having to shoot in log and then grade in post is very, very appealing. So I, I may check into that uh, a little bit more. The uh, new top frame rate uh, for stills burst, seven frames per second versus six frames per second, oh, okay. Uh, the Sony a6300, which I'm recording with right now, uh, will shoot bursts up to 11 frames per second and is less than one-third the price, so okay. Uh, I think most importantly, there's no in-body image stabilization, uh, where for a couple of hundred dollars less, you get that in the Sony a7X, two twins, and uh, Olympus and Panasonic have it as well. The Panasonic down to the kind of thousand dollar mark with the GX8. I mean, really pretty interesting. But let's spend time now with the signature upgrade 4K and get into it. Number one, the 5D Mark uh, IV suffers from an enormous deficit with a 1.74x crop factor, I believe, when shooting in UHD. Now, in comparison, the A7R2 and the A7S2 have no crop factor, uh, except in the A7R2, if you want to, you can set it to 1.5, in other words, APS-C, which is great when you're doing telephoto, uh, when you want additional uh, reach. On the other hand, you're not required to do that. This is a big deal. It's a big deal because if you're shooting stills and video and you want to move seamlessly back and forth with the same field of view and you're at the wide end, you can't do it uh, with the 5D Mark IV. You, you just can't do it. And in fact, if you've got a 16 to 35 where you enjoy that 16 millimeter field of view on a full length, uh, full frame lens, you're gonna have to buy another lens, uh, which fits that crop factor. So. That's, that's really terrible, actually. That pretty well makes it a non-starter for me as a, a 4K camera. So that's that story. Uh, Tony says that the codec on the uh, 5D Mark IV generates a file of 266 gigabytes for one hour of footage versus 40 gigabytes for uh, the Sony's and the Panasonic GH4. This is unbelievable. Now, m maybe it's because it's intra-frame, but uh, Tony didn't say that. Uh, I, I really want to take a closer look at that because if it's the same quality, uh, the same codec function, but just a lot less efficient, this is also uh, kind of full stop. I, I wouldn't use the camera. It just doesn't seem like 4K has been implemented particularly well. Let's continue because the maximum frame rate is 30 frames per second in 4K. That's no big deal. Most hybrid cameras only go up to 30 frames per second. Uh, the uh, 1DX Mark II, I believe, goes up to 60 frames per second. But what's more interesting to me is when you drop down to full HD. So when we see HD, uh, we have to remember that some people will distinguish between HD, which is 720, and FHD, or full HD, which is 1080. That's especially important with the 5D Mark IV because in full HD, it only goes up to 60 frames per second. In order to get 120 frames per second, you have to drop down to 720. And that is a significant difference in resolution. And again, for me, that's kind of full stop. <coughs> you don't use the camera. Uh, 
The Sony A6300 does 120 frames per second in full HD. The Panasonic GH4 does uh, 96 frames per second in full HD. And this camera is coming out, uh, I guess, volume shipments in the fourth quarter of 2016. That's just uncool. Uh, you can't send the 4K signal out through the HDMI port. There is no SDI, so you cannot send or record to an external recorder, a 4K recorder. So not a big deal for me particularly, but other people may feel very, very different, especially if you want to use a, a different codec like ProRes. You're just SOL. Because it's an optical viewfinder, the 5D Mark IV doesn't address the lack of exposure assists, focus assists, there's no peaking, there are no zebras. You can't do false color, you can't do any of that. You can't even use the viewfinder when you're shooting video. You are like on a bad consumer camera where you're just looking at the screen on the back. Again, for a $3,500 camera coming out in volume at the end of 2016, that's pretty well uh, a non-starter. There is no log setting uh, that doesn't burn with me, but it might burn with you. Um, I mean, if you're doing 4K, especially if you're doing full digital cinema 4K, image quality is clearly important to you, and not being able to get maximum dynamic range out of the camera, yeah. Um, now, I haven't seen and haven't been able to find what the bit depth is, uh, color space, but I'm assuming it's 8-bit uh, 420. Most hybrid cameras are like that. Um, that doesn't particularly bother me, uh, but just heads up. Okay, so with all of that said, who is the Canon 5D Mark IV? Four. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, if you feel that I'm trashing the camera, please, it's not my intention. Uh, it's, there's so much that Canon has had going for it for so long, but there are forces at work here, which I want to get into shortly, which make it a less than optimal choice for an increasing number of people. But, let's put it this way, it's not for people whose primary emphasis is on video, uh, as I've just gone through it. It's not. Uh, it's not for people whose emphasis is on ultimate uh, still image quality, photographic quality. Even within the brand, uh, the 5DS twins do better. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, Canon like, a camera like the A7R2 with 42 megapixel sensor, lack of anti-aliasing filter, is likely just going to be a, a better camera, a better sensor. And it's not uh, for people looking uh, at getting the best or biggest bang for the buck across brands. But with that being said, if you have a heavy investment in Canon glass as a workaday pro uh, and or you'll be enlarging your images on actual paper beyond say A3 size, uh, and, on the other hand, you still want to dip your toe into the 4K waters, you want geotagging, uh, and you want touchscreen, uh, or you really need better autofocus than the 5D Mark III was able to give you, um, and you have and are satisfied with the quality of STM lenses needed to drive the performance uh, from dual pixel AF, uh, and finally, uh, if you have the money, well, the 5D Mark IV makes sense. And I'm not being snarky about this. I want to be very clear. The Canon bodies are robust as all get out. Uh, it is a proven body. It's got great physical ergos, arguably the best in the business. Uh, it's part of an incredibly well-populated uh, Canon ecosystem, which includes an extensive flash line, some of the best zooms uh, in the business, in the L-Glass, inarguably the best primes, uh, super telephotos out there. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, if you're already in Canon, you've made a significant investment in the gear and in learning how to use it. It's become second nature to you, and to give that up 
in order to swap over to a new system means you're not only going to take a hit on depreciation, but you're going to have to relearn uh, a new manual of arms. And that's a pretty strong disincentive from switching. But what's really interesting to me is to ask, what does the 5D Mark IV tell us about Canon and the broader industry? Well, no newsflash, but Canon simply will not cannibalize its dedicated cinema EOS line. And like Sony, uh, in fact, Canon's pricing uh, indicates a very clear awareness that unit volumes will continue to drop. And the only way to make up for it, in other words, the only way to adhere to the prime directive, is to sell higher margin products which can stand the lower unit volumes. So you can take a look at the 1DX Mark II, which is a $6,000 camera. Uh, which is where you get 60 frames per second. But you still don't have the focus assists and exposure assists because it's still a DSLR with a, an optical uh, viewfinder. Or even more interestingly, look at the Canon Cinema EOS C700, which was just announced for $28,000. Uh, the thing of it is, here's the bottom line. Canon is hitting the wall with DSLR technology and it is choosing not to invest significantly to get through that. That's not a criticism. It is an observation that makes sense to me and you can see that most clearly in the fact that recently uh, Canon has made significant investments via acquisition into other markets like security and defense with its 2.8 billion dollar acquisition of Axis software. Let's think about this using uh, other industries, uh, the hard disk drive industry and the automobile industry. We'll talk about the Porsche 911. 30 years ago, a guy by the name of Dick Foster uh, with McKinsey Consulting Firm wrote a book entitled Innovation, The Attacker's Advantage. And this was the first time that I'd ever been exposed to the concept of technology S-curves. An S-curve looks like this. And you can turn that into the three stages of the evolution of any new technology. At the beginning, the technology is new. Uh, you don't get that much functionality out of it. But at some point, you continue to pour time and effort into it. And you really begin to climb the function curve. It gets really, really powerful. And then, as with everything, at some point, it levels off. This was the case in a follow-up book by Harvard professor Clay Christensen uh, entitled The Innovator's Dilemma, When New Technologies Cause Great Firms to Fail. And he used the hard disk drive business in the 80s as an example of how that worked. Uh, he talked about IBM being a master of the big, high-capacity, uh, high-speed disk drive being undercut by companies like Seagate who were making five and a quarter inch drives, much lower capacity, but much lower price. And people were willing to live with that because the future of that particular branch of hard disk drives was much clearer. There was much room for improvement. Why do I even introduce this? Well, because what's clear to me is that the DSLR technology curve, or wave if you like, is cresting. If you think of this as a series of waves down at the beach, you know, when you want to body surf or you want to uh, surf with a board, you want to catch the top of the wave and ride it. But eventually it loses energy and it's gone, but there's a wave coming in behind it. The wave coming in behind DSLRs and optical viewfinders clearly uh, consists of mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras. That's what the Sony A7 uh, uh, X2 twins are, the Panasonic GH4, the Oli OMD EM5, the Fuji X-T2, all of these things. Uh, the, the Hasselblad X1D, uh, yeah, these are all interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras which have tremendous opportunity to grow and there are simply fewer of us who uh, are willing to pay for functions we don't need uh, when we are willing to pay for functions that a DSLR doesn't give us. And of course, we understand what the wave is coming behind 
mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras, and that's the smartphones, especially with Apple's announcement uh, last week of the 7 Plus with dual lens technology, uh, the first implementation, uh, I guess, of their acquisition of Lynx. Uh, and as another example, and as an example of having problems in the early days, uh, uh, is Lights L16, which has been delayed a number of times, which uses a number of tiny lens sensor combos. By the way, Apple has the issue too. When they talked about the two lenses in the 7 Plus, one is the equivalent of 28 millimeter, one is the equivalent of 56 millimeter, and they still have effective uh, f uh, depth of field equivalents of f12 or f11 on full frame cameras, so they're going to use software to simulate uh, bokeh under a proscribed set of circumstances. So these are perfect examples of technology which promises uh, tremendous growth trajectory but uh, aren't there yet. But let's talk about cars. Um, so think about the 911. The 911 was created in 1963, uh, an iconic uh, vehicle, and every few years Porsche does something to improve it. Uh, it hones the form. Now, they can uh, go from air-cooled to water-cooled. They can up the displacement. They can add turbochargers. They can stretch the wheelbase a little bit. They can widen it a little bit. But they are constrained in two profound ways. One, by the aesthetic. It is an iconic design, and when they thought that it had run its course and introduced the 928, it didn't work. People went back to the 911. But the second way that they are constrained is by engineering choice, hanging that engine over the rear wheels. There's only so much that you can do with it, even if you go to all-wheel drive. So in the real day, uh, or in the real world on a day-to-day -day basis, no one can use even half of that performance. And if you've ever sat inside uh, a recent vintage 911, the number of buttons in the dash is just infuriating. It's, Im it's impossible. Um, and if uh, someone wants to drive in snow, and they don't have a four-wheel drive a Carrera S4, uh, or they want to carry four adults comfortably, well, there are simply a lot of other cars now that are a lot cheaper and do a better job. The Subaru uh, WRX is a $30,000 car, four-wheel drive, four doors, uh, probably more reliable. The base price for the 911 begins at $89,400. So what does all of this mean for you? Well, uh, if you're the kind of person, uh, or by analogy, uh, wants uh, and can afford a Porsche, you're going to buy a Porsche. If you want the Canon 5D Mark IV and you can afford it, you're going to get it and you're going to love it because you will have bought it for the right reasons, um, most of which I've outlined above. But as I said earlier, the number of us out there who fit into this category is shrinking because there are cheaper alternatives which have reached the point where they are actually better in specific instances. And of course, for me, what comes to mind is the Sony A7R2, which is a better video camera. and. I'm betting it's a better still camera too. As far as image quality, uh, certainly on a par from a lens perspective, and you may not like the ergos as much, and, and I might agree with you, but uh, it's a heck of a camera. Um, also, as long as you don't mind the overheating. And then there's the Sony a6300 or something like the $798 uh, Panasonic GX85 which shoots 4K and has more of the things you need for a hybrid than the 5D Mark IV. So, is the 5D Mark IV really just a poor excuse of an upgrade? Is it a snore? Nothing new? I mean, 4K, four and a half years later, big deal. Or is it something more? Now, uh, even though I personally switched from Canon to Sony a couple of years ago and have never looked back, uh, the 5D Mark IV is neither a poor upgrade or a boring one. This is a very significant camera. Uh, well, it's an incredibly solid camera, as its predecessors have been, uh, and it's capable of creating uh, or capturing outstanding images in the right hands. In most meaningful ways, 
it is a significant upgrade over the 5D Mark III. But in the end, what makes it a significant camera in my book, uh, what makes it more important by far than the 5D Mark III which preceded it, is that the Canon 5D Mark IV is the clearest indication yet of the limits of the technology that spawned the original and the difference in evolutionary potential between DSLRs and the next wave of technology embodied by mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras.